series last week um, on 2 Chronicles 7.14, uh, and it's actually, if you look in your announcements, the uh, scripture, 2 Chronicles 7.14, is right above the announcements, so you can follow along on that, and um, you'll have an idea of what I'm preaching about, and I'll refer to it in just a moment. But today I want to talk about persistent prayer. Even the most talented may not get it right the first time. In a 1995 interview with Paul McCartney, he shared he once wrote a song with the first line, scrambled eggs, oh my baby, how I love your legs. <laughs> Have you ever heard that song before? No, not likely because McCartney threw those words away, which was probably the greatest decision he ever made. But right after writing those lines, he went on to write this. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. You know that song, don't you? And since then, yesterday has played on the radio over six million times, more than any other record in the history of music. It also happens to be Paul McCartney's favorite song. You see, the difference between failure and success, between scrambled eggs and yesterday, <laughs> is persistence. It's being willing to fail and make a mistake and to not give up, but to keep on going. And in fact, persistence is a very, very important aspect and characteristic of prayer. If you're looking at 2 Chronicles 7.14 right now, uh, right above the announcements, uh, you'll see a scripture there that uh, speaks the following. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, I talked about that last week, so I'm going to cover something else this week, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'm going to focus in on those three pieces of the verse here today with you. 2 Chronicles 7.14, particularly this part of that scripture, talks about the power of persistent prayer and talks about the importance of not giving up, even though you want to. First of all, it talks about prayer. And as we all know, when someone prays, they're basically seeking to try to connect with God in some way, shape, or form. It might take the form of an intercession that you're lifting up to God. It might be sharing your emotions or feelings with God. It might be crying out to God in some way. Uh, but prayer is seeking to connect with God. It involves us sharing, listening, and surrendering. Um, and again, for some of us, that might be a new concept. A lot of times, for a lot of people, prayer is simply making a petition to God, letting God know what you'd like or what you need or what a friend might need, and then you're on your way. Um, but prayer is much more than that. Prayer is sharing your needs, definitely. It's letting God know what's in your heart and what you need and desire. But it is also listening to God, taking time just to be quiet and see how God might speak to you, as well as surrendering to what you hear God saying to you to do whether it's uh, in a sense of an audible voice or just an impression you have in your spirit or life event events that lead you in a certain way. E. Stanley Jones observes that prayer is surrender to the will of God and cooperation with his will. If I throw out a boat hook, catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? In the same way, prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. I don't know about you, but there certainly have been times in my life where, um, how can I put this graciously toward myself and toward all, toward all of us, um, where I felt like I was struggling with God to get my way, like I was in an arm wrestling match with God. And that simply for me is an illustration at this point of how much I really didn't understand what prayer was about. Are there things that we really want? Are there people that we cry out to God for? Are there miracles we really would like to see happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's part of our humanity. It's part of who we are as, as people. And that's a beautiful part of who we are. 
But there are times in our prayer life, aren't we, where we need that idea of the shore and the hook. And what exactly is it that's pulling what? And ultimately, we need to be pulled toward God's will. When we love it and when we rejoice in it and also when we struggle it, struggle with it. Prayer and seek my face. And so one of the things we see here in 2 Chronicles 7.14 is this aspect of prayer being pulled toward the will of God. And one of the things that God desires in each one of us is that we would seek him. Have you ever had somebody in your life who wasn't really seeking you out, but rather the things that you could give them? It could actually be said of our children, depending on what stage of life that they're in, right? It could be said of us at one time in our lives as well, especially in the teenage and college years, I seem to remember. It was more about what we could get rather than who they were and spending time with them. And each one of us know the reality of that feeling, the reality of going through that season of life, but also the reality that we always want a relationship to be more than that. And God wants a relationship that is more than that with me and, and you. That's why he says in this particular part of the scripture, if my people will pray and seek my face. In the Hebrew, this communicates the idea of desiring the very presence of God. We begin with prayer, but then progress more earnestly into the spiritual atmosphere of the Holy One's presence. In this holy reality, in the reality of God, there's a profound sense of His loving presence, of His holiness, of His peace, and of His radiant light. There's a sense of being in the presence of God. And for those of you who have had that experience, you know what I'm talking about. And for those of you who aren't quite sure what I'm talking about today, I want to share something with you. God wants you to have that experience of him, the experience of his love for you, the experience of his holy presence, the experience of his radiant light, the experience more than anything else that he loves you more than anyone or anything than you can ever begin to imagine. And as you and I come home to the reality of that experience, I believe we are coming home to one of the most profound truths about life and about all of eternity, and that is God really does love you. <laughs> he really does. I've been a priest now. It'll be 32 years in June. You want, you want to know what the number one thing that most people don't believe? That God loves them. At the end of the day, that's the thing that most people really don't believe about God, that God really does love them. If my people who are called by their name, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Beloved, one of the things I want to encourage you about in your own prayer life is that whenever you go to prayer, don't, don't let it always be a Hail Mary pass. Don't always, don't always let it be something that you really desperately need from God, and that's the only time you go to God. But, but let me rather say to you, let it also be often times that you go to God where you're just in his presence. You're just touched by his love and the warmth of his presence and him embracing you. Guess what? If you begin to have that to be the heart of your experience in prayer, God will take care of all the other needs that you have anyways. Guess what? He already knows about the other things that you need and you want. He, he reads your heart from afar, afar, all of us. And as you and I learn to delight just being in his presence and loving to be with him, all of those other things will be taken care of. You know, in fact, one of the things the Lord spoke to me a long time ago is, Joe, you know what? Why don't you focus in on what I want you to do and I'll take care of everything else. Now, I still let him know what I'd like, <laughs> but I've begun to spend a lot more time just focusing in on him and being with him, and that's made all the difference in my life, and that will make all the difference in your life as well. Pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. 
You see, as we pray to the Lord and as we seek his face and we come into the beauty of his radiant light, something begins to happen in us. Not only do we begin to experience God's great love for us, but his light begins to shine into every part of our life. And guess what? It begins to expose some of the dark corners. It begins to illuminate some of the sin that is in our life in a way that we haven't seen it before. And in that reality, God invites us and calls us to turn from our wicked ways. To be in the presence of God is to be deeply convicted of our own sinfulness and the need to repent. We need to turn in a completely new life direction, away from our darkness into God's light, departing wickedness for him. And so when God is saying turn from our wicked ways, it's like, here I am facing this way toward my darkness and my wickedness and my sin and some of those things that I love to do too, like you. And God is calling me to turn from that in a completely new direction toward him, 180 degrees in a completely new direction in my life. In fact, in the New Testament, that's what repentance is rendered in the Greek, metanoia. It means to turn in a whole new direction. So again, just where you're setting for a moment, humor the preacher, okay? I'm setting like this with you. I'm looking straight ahead. Turn your head to the right if you can. Now turn it all the way over to the left. That's turning away from your wickedness and your sin. And let's be honest for just a moment. It is so much easier to turn our head like that than it is to turn from our darkness and our wickedness toward his light, isn't it? Very, very challenging and grace-filled thing to do. We need to turn from our hatred to mercy. We need to turn from greed and materialism to faithful stewardship. We need to turn from doubt and always questioning God to beginning to have faith in him. We need to turn from gossip and destroying people behind their backs to blessing them and inviting that person who's sharing with us that incredibly juicy uh, morsel of gossip to begin to say to them, you know what, why don't we pray for this person? I think they're hosed up too. Let's pray for them. Maybe God will touch them. We need to turn from lust and wanting the other someone or something that we don't have in our life to love. We need to turn from oppression to serving other people. We need to turn from despair to hope. We need to turn from rebelling against God and saying, God, in some way, shape, or form in our heart, I'm going to have it my way. We need to turn from that rebellion, and we need to surrender to God. Let me share something with you. And again, it just comes from my own heart. I'm just sharing with you a clue that I've gotten along on the journey, and that's simply this. If you keep struggling with a particular area of sin in your life, and like me, I'll raise my hand first, and like me, you've been struggling with it for maybe a decade, two decades, maybe five decades, there's probably some rebellion in your heart. On some level, you're rebelling against God, or there's a deep healing that needs to happen for you, a deep brokenness, a deep pain that you need to be set free from. And in just a few minutes during communion, there's going to be a healing prayer team in the back that's going to pray with you for any healing need that you have. And you can be as general or specific as you want. Everything that's shared there is is confidential. But if you have a monkey on your back, if you have a wicked way or a sin in your life that you just feel ashamed about, you feel tremendous guilt about, but you cannot break free from it, will you go back there today? Will you go back there today as a step of faith? It'd be as simple as saying, you know what? I'm not even going to tell you what it is because I'm just, I'm just struggling with it. But would you pray for me? And they'll pray for you and you can have a breakthrough. You know, this is one of the things I've learned. There are some, some sins and some struggles that you and I go through. They got us beat. You're defeated. If you... I'm I'm laughing with you. I'm not laughing at you. If you've been struggling with it for five decades and you still ain't got it beat, you ain't going to beat it. 
isn't going to happen. You need someone else. You need someone to come alongside with you and pray for you that you'd be set free. As you and I begin to pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, one of the things I want to encourage us to realize is we need to turn from our wicked ways toward the Lord. We need to turn toward his light and toward his mercy. We need to turn toward the mercy that is found uniquely in the cross. And you know what? We need to do that in a heartfelt way. You know, the cross that we have up here is very special. You know, if you want to come up and touch it during communion, come around here and do that, given this message, I give you permission to do that and fill the nails on there. If it's between that and going to the healing prayer team, I want you to go to the healing prayer team first. But you can come back and touch this cross of nails. Because one of the things you and I need to grab a hold of is the cross today. Jesus died on the cross for every human being's sin that has ever lived and who will ever live. He's died for your guilt. He's died for your shame. He's died for all the times that you beat yourself up for all the things you do wrong. He's died for that. And you know, one of the things that should happen in our lives, I think, is that when we confess our sins to the Lord and we begin to turn from our wicked ways and we really begin to experience the, his victory in that, we should have some joy, don't you think? Oh, you don't seem too convinced about that. Got a bunch of Episcopalians in here today. You got to hear this message. I'm going to say it again. When you are forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered on the cross for your sins and, and died a torturous death and rose from the dead victorious over the, the, the grave and over sin, when he forgives your sin, there should be some joy in your heart. There should be a smile that begins to break out in the depth of your being that just comes on your face and you got this grin and it just won't go away. That's mercy. That's forgiveness. That's being washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. And that's how the confession of sin should be. It should feel like you've been, you've been rolling around in a mud hole. And you're all mud. You're covered with mud from head to toe. And you go into a shower and you take a shower and you wash all of that mud off. You lather yourself up. You wash all the soap off. And guess what? You feel clean. You feel better. You feel ready to go out and meet the world. That's how the mercy of the Lord is washed clean, totally clean in the blood of the Lamb. I guess what I want to say to you here today is a lot of you do an awful good job, awfully good job of embracing your shame and your guilt, but a lot of us don't do very well at embracing the mercy and joy of the Lord afterwards. There's something wrong with that. There's something completely wrong with that. You need to receive the mercy of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. If after you confess your sins, you're not full in joy, of joy and happiness, I have a direction for you. Stay on your knees until you are. Stay on your knees until you have the joy of the Lord and a smile hit your face as well as in your soul. Then you have received the mercy and forgiveness of the Lord and get up off your knees after that. Some of you might be on your knees for a while because you have never been open to receiving the Lord's joy and mercy after his forgiveness of you. That's okay with me. Stay there until it comes. Mark Batterson shares in Draw the Circle, there comes a time in your life when you must quit talking to God about the mountain in your life and start talking to the mountain about your God. You proclaim his power. You declare his sovereignty. You affirm his faithfulness. You stand on his word. You cling to his promises. You receive in fullness the mercy and the forgiveness and the redemption that Jesus offers you from the cross and in his resurrected life, and you receive it with joy and with excitement and with abundance and with the new life that he comes to bring me and you today. Oh, I'm praying that you'll start smiling. <laughs> I'm praying that you'll start smiling. 
And so we're going to do something different today. Well, one more thing I want to share with you. Remember this. This will help you to smile as well. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You need to remember this as you confess your sins to the Lord. You need to remember this as you get hit your knees and you come before him with the guilt and the shame that you've had maybe for decades. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if it's from Romans, if a little later on after you've confessed your sin, you just keep, this guilt keeps coming on you and the shame keeps coming on you about it, I want you to remember that scripture and I want you to say it. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want to hear it now. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh my gosh, you know that scripture. You know that scripture. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Guess what? After you've confessed your sins, after you've received his forgiveness, if you were to go to God the next second and talk to him and say, oh, do you remember what I confessed to you about a second ago? He would say, what? He would say, what? What? He, you know what? It says he puts his, his, your sins as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember them. As soon as you confess them, they are gone. They are forgiven. He doesn't remember your sin. You remember it. But guess what? You're the only one. What's up with that? What's up with that? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you here today at the end of this message to do something probably you have never heard before, but you've heard those things before here anyways. <laughs> Repent and be joyful. Repent and receive the mercy of the Lord.